Bangkok was born 400 years ago. Located on the east coast of America, along the Atlantic Ocean, in a naturally protected harbor, the city is actually a bay strewn with islands. The most famous of them is Manhattan. At the time, it was 47 square kilometers. Back then, Manhattan was nothing like the current exuberant city it's now known as, the epitome of the American dream. A constantly buzzing, bustling city with eight and a half million inhabitants and hundreds of skyscrapers. In reality, this steel and concrete jungle has sprung up on what, not so long ago, was a real Garden of Eden. I love to go to Times Square and there's all the lights and all the people and all the craziness and to just try and imagine that there was a stream there and a pond and maybe a black bear walking by. This is Manhattan today. And here's how it looked four centuries ago, covered in forest, interspersed with marshes and streams. A few hundred Native Americans were its only inhabitants, hunting and fishing to survive. But around 1620, Dutch settlers came to the Wild Island. They bought it for about $25. Despite the region's occasionally severe weather, the colonists settled on Lower Manhattan. One has to admit, the location is incredibly strategic. For starters, the harbor is extremely easy to access from the Atlantic Ocean. What's more, the two rivers, the Hudson to the west and the East River, offer gateways to countless commercial hubs in the eastern United States. New York's growth is linked to the fact that its port was exceptionally located, a protected harbor that quickly made it one of the largest ports in North America. Lower Manhattan urbanized quickly. The population tripled in a mere 20 years. And soon, the rest of the island was developed, but in a less orderly fashion. The founders of the town realized there'd be no way to resist its fate. Immigrants were arriving, and the city was exploding, so to speak. At the turn of the 19th century, New York shifted into gear to keep up with its ambitions. By the mid-19th century, New York had exploded into a metropolis. With its extraordinary demographic growth, Manhattan was no longer enough the neighboring districts began to develop. Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Since 1898, these five boroughs have formed the modern city of New York. They're connected by an extensive system of tunnels and bridges. One of the most well-known is the Brooklyn Bridge, which links Brooklyn to Manhattan. It was the first steel wire suspension bridge, and for years was the longest in the world, 1,830 meters. New York became the city of superlatives. Buildings kept going up and up. The Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building. Skyscrapers sprang from the ground like mushrooms, breaking records left and right. In the late 1920s, a rather comical competition developed between the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, which ended up winning with its antenna that was taller than the one its opponent unexpectedly surprised the city with. Today, New York boasts the most skyscrapers in the world after Hong Kong. But these towering giants have a direct impact on floods, like in 1938, when a hurricane paralyzed the metropolis for days. Still, New Yorkers didn't learn their lesson. We've decided to, to build these big buildings and then use you know, gas and coal-powered fuel to heat the buildings, right? Which is leading to climate change, right? It's putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is leading to climate change, which is making the sea level rise, which is then flooding parts of the city. So um, there's no doubt if you were to start again, you would build the city in a different way, in a way that would be more compatible with the nature of the place. In 400 years, Manhattan, which started out as virgin territory, morphed into an urban giant. 97% of its ground is covered in concrete. Today, this urbanization has become problematic. 
The soil is like a huge sponge that can absorb the, wa the rainwater and the snow melt. But now you've like limited it. And so you make the, you actually make more floods happen because of that, right? It becomes flashier because the rain falls down and it has nowhere to go, right? It can't go down into the ground anymore. It can't go up into the vegetation because you've cleared all the trees. It can't go back into the atmosphere. So all it can do is flood. And that's why, you know, just small rains, you get floods all over New York. Luckily, New York had natural barriers that offered protection from storms. Except that, as it developed, almost every single one of them was destroyed. John F. Kennedy International Airport. 49 million passengers transit through here each year. JFK is located in the southeast of the city on Jamaica Bay. The bay stretches 100 square kilometers and is separated from the ocean by the Rockaway Peninsula. Originally, it was one of the East Coast's most beautiful nature reserves, an expanse of water strewn with a dozen marshy islets. It's a paradise within the city. So when you go there, it's often hard to believe that you are still in New York City. And yet this is where, in the late 40s, the airport runways were built right on top of the marshes which served to reduce wave energy. Essentially, it became a place that was, you know, over the years it had been a dumping ground and then it gradually became integrated into the rest of the city, but it had the issues of what had once been a wasteland. Um, of course, flat wetlands are often considered prime sites for creating airports, which need vast expanses of flat territory. To dry out the marshlands, dredgers suck sand up from the bottom of the bay through huge pipes. The sand is then mixed with cement and dumped into the marshlands to make the ground more solid. The result? The vast majority of marshland in the bay has been paved over. To top it off, four water treatment plants have also been built here. They too contribute to polluting the bay and destroying the marshlands. And yet the marshes would have been a great help when Superstorm Sandy slammed the region with its gigantic waves. Jamaica Bay, I think, you know, because so much of its edges had been hardened, drained, developed, you know, everything became basically paved over <laughs> in a massive way. I think that definitely things would have been different had it been a, a quite uh, absorptive marsh platform because marshlands act like barriers during storms. When waves come in from the ocean, wetlands act like sponges that absorb water and store it. This not only slows waves down, it also makes them smaller. But it's not just the marshlands in Jamaica Bay that have been destroyed. In reality, over 80% of the marshes throughout the entire city have been filled in. This is the case with Central Park, for example, New York's famous Green Lung. Here, too, the wetlands were massively drained to build a vast artificial park. With global warming, the shift in the island's topography is problematic because the entire flow of water has been modified. The flows of rainwater to the sea or to the river will follow both above ground and below ground, the topographies that existed there before. So you get floods locally because of that pathway for rainwater. And some of it means that the underground stream are gorged with water when there's a major rainstorm. Especially since New Yorkers can't count on their drainage system to absorb the overflow of rain. 150 years ago, the choice was made to develop a combined system that funneled both rainwater and sewage into the same pipes. At that time, people designed these systems the best they knew. 
and there was nothing in the historic record that would indicate that they would have to build for such extreme events. The upshot is that during storms, the sewers overflow. So essentially, fecal matter is floating around in the Hudson and in the Atlantic, and they have to close the beaches because it's not healthy for a couple of days until Mother Nature flushes it out. In fact, as it developed, New York made no allowance for the fact it sat on the waterfront and consequently could be flooded. Until now, the city hasn't really suffered, since in 400 years, there's only been one major storm per century. But 2012 was an irrevocable turning point. A massive hurricane struck New York. When they tell you to evacuate, you need to evacuate. October 29th, 2012. Hurricane Sandy struck the city full force. Gigantic waves surged through the streets of Manhattan. So the storm surge that came in was large and wide. And also, it came at the same time as the high tide. And so we had a little bit more than four meters of storm surge um, coming into lower Manhattan, plus the waves, particularly on the ocean front, the waves would add to that. That was the highest on the historical record since New York City was founded. 48 dead, entire neighborhoods destroyed, the subway at a standstill. New York panicked. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. It's a hurricane. What the hell is this? At 9.15 p.m., a power plant exploded, grinding the city to a halt. The entire city went black um, completely in the middle of the night. And you could still see uh, the lights from Times Square, which is up on 42nd Street, but everything south of uh, about 30th Street was completely black. Um, and of course, nobody knew at that time how long the power was going to be out or what had happened. Um, but the power ended up being out in most parts um, for almost a week. New York City denied its existence on the water, pretty much. And that was a reminder. Sandy really brought this home. We are a city on the ocean.